Welcome to The Cherry Picker, the horror movie podcast where we like to kill people, but not really. I'm your host, Zach Cherry, and with me, as always, is... Eddie of Edward is Truth. And this episode, we are diving back into Sinister, released Mm -hmm. uh, October 12th, 2012. However, uh, it initially had its premiere at South by Southwest on March 11th, 2012. So it is 10 years old uh, at the time of this episode's release. Um, At least I'm going by that date, (laughs) because that's why we chose this episode, because it's... uh, it turned 10 years old, and I haven't seen it since it uh, came out in the theater. So 10 years now. Or what did you think about really. it? Um, <laughs> at the time, I don't know. Oh, I had I had issues. I mean, it, it was definitely not my favorite, uh, and I'll, I'll get more into that uh, okay. while, we, while we go into the episode. Um, but before I really wanted to start, I, uh, just this really interesting thing that I did see that's kind of listed on the imdb that i wanted to read here uh in 2020 forbes magazine conducted a study science of scare project where the heart rate of the viewers were monitored while they watched a number of horror horror films out of 35 films this movie sinister uh one (laughs) having the highest average heart rate at 86 spiking at 131 Uh, beats per minute thus it's often uh, being deemed the scariest movie ever made um uh... (laughs) i feel like maybe like the the most like jump i mean we'll we'll get into the jump scares here but i i just while we're on the topic of the jump scares i i do want to say that i think that there's a right and wrong way to do a jump scare in a horror film and sinister does it the right way. So, I agree. um, and you know, just if, if there's any confusion about that, I feel that like the wrong kind of way to do a jump scare is like, okay, here's just a, an example. Like basically everything in the, in the late nineties, but like H2O Halloween H2O, um, when oh. every fucking time a character would like, like, I'm just thinking of like Josh Hartnett coming up behind LL cool J and just being like, <laughs> Hey, can you open the gate and let us out? And it's, and there'd be like that sting, like boom. And and then it'd be like, oh, yeah. okay, that we don't have to be afraid of it because it's just Josh Hartnett. And that kind of, that conditions your audience to think that like, okay, well now the next time that you're, you're kind of building up this tension, we know that there's not, whatever it is, isn't going to be scary. So when like the, mm-hmm. the villain or the boogeyman or Michael Myers, whoever uh, appears, you're already kind of like, you're over it, you know, like just psychologically, you've been through that, so you just you're conditioned to not be scared of him. Whereas, kind of lowers in, your morale as an audience member. Like it just drop. You just let my interest drops when I'm just kind of like, I, oh, they went for the. Well, yeah. I I watched like a video <laughs> on uh, YouTube uh, a while ago, and it was like this whole thing. It's just about jump scares, and it kind of like compared it to an orgasm. Uh, I'm just saying that like you've already climaxed at that point when they like set it up for something that's not actually <laughs> you're, what you're not supposed to be scared of. Uh, but with this film um, in particular, and I, I think a lot of the films from the early 2000s and 10s uh, uh, did did this correctly, where they made sure that if there was a jump scare, it was based around the thing that we are supposed to be afraid of. In this case, yeah. Bagul, Bagul. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Boogie. Um, oh, there, there was one jump scare in the movie that um, I didn't think really, like, I mean, it might have been creepy at the time, but it just, it was one of those things that, like, in the trajectory of the movie, it just, like, it doesn't make any sense to me, and that's when the sun came out of the box because I'm just like, Oh really? It was freaky at the time. But then it's just like, what does this have to do with anything? Cause like his night terrors, like ultimately were uh-huh. nothing. And uh-huh. okay. I, Cause I already see that you, you want to get a lot into this. So I'm just right off the bat. I'm just going to say kind of like my opinions here. Okay. Um, Cause I think they're largely the same as what they were when I first saw them. But I do, 
giving this 10 years, I do have a, like a greater appreciation for this movie. I think this is a okay. really good horror movie. I don't think it's yeah. a great horror movie. And I think that there's, there's something missing. There's an ingredient or two that are missing. And I don't know exactly what it is. Like I have a pretty good idea what I think it is. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I'll just we'll, through this discussion in this episode, we'll kind of figure out what went wrong with this movie. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to put it out there that I feel that this is imperfect. Like there, there's, there's something that could have been done a lot better. So okay. having said that, what are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting because uh, first off, I remember the first time I saw it, um, I think I did see it in the theater and I think I liked it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I think I even watched it again. I think I rented it. Uh, one more time just to kind of see it again and get scared or whatever. And um, and it was fine. Like, it was good. But I did, hadn't even really thought about it until, like, we brought it up for this pod. And in preparation for it, I I don't know. I thought the, one of the only things that I actually remembered about the movie was the box with little uh, uh, Trevor mm-hmm. uh, erupting out of it and everything like that. So I knew it was coming, so I didn't know what kind of an impact it was going to have on me, but I just remembered it as a very strange beat in the movie. It was something that was, uh, at the time, unexpected, but also still just unusual to watch. And it got me this time because I forgot about the screaming. <laughs> <laughs> All I remembered were legs and arms, kind of like almost in a balletic move, yeah. erupting, you know, like like blossoming like a flower from this cardboard box I, in a dark room. I forgot, I mean, it, yeah. not necessarily like forgot what happened, because I mean, like a lot of this movie is kind of the same beat over and over again. Um, I just <laughs> forgot like the placement of when things happen. And I pro- I might have forgotten about the, okay. the sun, the family in general, like <laughs> I forget a lot about them. But uh, I... well. I do think, I mean, I don't want to say this is the scariest movie. I mean, like, according to Forbes, I, uh, no. it's not the scariest. But I think that, you know, in terms of maybe more recent uh, movies or just something more contemporary, even though it's like 10 years old now, uh, I, I'd say it is effective. I feel that um, Bagul, mm-hmm. Bag, I don't know how, is it Bagul? Bagul? Bagul. Bagul. Yeah. Um, like B apostrophe. That's not how it's spelled, but Bagul. It's spelled B-A-G-H-U-U-L. Uh, yeah. And he's a, an ancient deity, or I forget how they explain him. Um, but I think he's a very uh, effective, like iconic, like, you know, he could, you know, obviously not in the... In the uh, the the realm of your Freddies and Jasons and and Leatherface or right. or any of, but you know I think that you know people remember him he has a he's almost like a a cross between Slenderman and Billy the the puppet that's Saw. what I thought that yeah. was the, one of the only other things that I remembered about the movie was and I know that there's like some guy underwater at some point he's always like kind of a, he ends up being revealed I think that he's in the background of like the these super eight movies of like these families being and I, but I barely even remembered that I just remembered like grainy movies with like mm-hmm. a kind of really really <laughs> like um like underwater when you can barely see like the the mask or the makeup or whatever it is yeah. um it it does look like kind of like a hodgepodge paper mache billy from saw <laughs> mm-hmm. where the fig for, forgot to paint the little targets on his on his cheeks but um yeah. <laughs> but uh Ultimately, like, uh, I, I really did, I think we're both going to basically kind of be saying the same thing in different ways, uh, because I got a newfound appreciation for this movie, revisiting it, but I under, I completely understand what you're saying. I didn't mm-hmm. feel, uh, maybe it didn't bother me as much as it, as it seems to have, like, kind of irked you, um, just in sense of, like... I thought, oh, you know, this would have been an interesting way to go at a particular point in the story that they didn't go, so I'd say... Arguably, maybe the last, I i don't know time was, but maybe maybe 10 minutes or less around that like time yeah. from like, I'm a not certain irked part of the story. It's all, it's this... all very predictable. Yeah. I'm okay, not, yeah, not I'm not irked, irked but... by this movie at all. I like, okay. I enjoy it. Um, I just sure. think that it, it kind of, it, it becomes a little basic. And uh-huh. I think that yeah. the reason for that is because it is very plot uh, focused. Um, mm-hmm. And this is kind of where my problem is, is just in terms of character. And not that, like, I, I, I think that we can both agree that 
Ethan Hawke uh, playing Ellison Oswald. Yeah. Like he's he basically carries the whole movie. <laughs> like no everybody else in the movie like does nothing. And this is kind, <laughs> this is kind of my biggest gripe um, is the fact that it's like the family feels so pointless. I mean they're 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 supposed to be there because the 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 fact of having the family there is part of the whole um, like Bagul ritual whatever you want to call sure. it. Sure. But. I couldn't, like, just in terms of, like, casting or writing or whatever, like, they couldn't have picked, like, a worse motley crew of people. Like, I look at this family and not one, I guess, like, maybe, like, Ethan Hawke and the daughter, like, I could see them as being related. But, like, the mother and the son, I just, like, are these, are they a family? Like, I don't get it. There's even a point (laughs) where when the, she's reprimanding, I think it's the son, and she says to Ellis, she's just, like, do you want to know what happened? Your son, and I know she's just being saying it in a, in a very like reprimanding way. Like, do you not want to know what your son did? Um, or if, if it might have been the daughter she was talking about, but it was like I even questioned like, is she the stepmother? Um, oh, <laughs> but it's just like it. What's interesting is that that actress she came in and she read for it, and she read for it mm-hmm. in an American accent. Um, that like that's because mm. it, it didn't call for her to be British or anything, and 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 you know yeah. she got the job, and then the director, uh, Scott Derrickson, is just like, you know what? I think I want you to do this in your regular voice, and, and it's just it's such a strange decision because it's like, it it creates more of a disconnect between huh. him and just in terms of her having a different accent. Um, because yeah. already, like, I feel like the family is so separated from him, and that, might, and you know, I, at first I thought, is that intentional? Because they're they're they have the scene at the end where, I guess, she confronts him when she f- figures out that this was the murder house or whatever, and and they go into the whole thing, and he says like, this is my legacy, um, like this is like this is the yes. work that I do, like this is my life, and she says like, no, I'm your life, and your children are your legacy. And mm. that would make sense, like, uh, creatively as to why the family is so sidelined throughout the movie. But the director, like, never mentions this. He, I listened to both commentaries. He did one as yeah. a director and the other as a writer because he wrote and directed it. And mm. there wasn't any mention of, like, how it was, like, a creative decision to kind of, like, make the family so <laughs> superfluous or, or just, you know, like, non-existent that okay. I don't get from the story that they're kind of like being sidelined because they're just trying to like emphasize this character, this one, the Ethan Hawke character as being so mm-hmm. kind of like in his own world and just like spiraling down through like the madness of, of uncovering all this Bagul stuff. I just see it as like you picked the wrong cast for the side characters and you didn't like fully develop them properly in the script. That's how I see it. Because I just, like, everything about them, I just, like, what's the point? Do you, do, like, do you understand what, what I mean? What I'm I saying? do. I understand what you're saying. I just, again, I think we're both going to say the same thing just in different ways. Because <laughs> well, none of that, none, cause none of what you've said particularly, like, occurred to me, not, not really, like, in terms of, like, her being English or in terms of, like, his disconnect from the family being rooted in, like, I actually got that fine. But, mm-hmm. and there were, other, there were other things I wrote that, like, could sound like criticisms for the writing, except I think they do work. Like, the one point where Ashley, the little girl, uh, uh, talks about, like, a night her night terror that she had when she hears them talking about uh, Trevor's night terror. And it goes completely unnoticed. Nobody doubles down on it. All that mm-hmm. happens is Ellison just completely, like, brushes her off at the breakfast table and just goes like, no, you don't have something like that. If you had something like that, we'd know. And it's like, uh, is no, and the mom's right there just like getting breakfast ready. And I'm like, is no one going to ask the child <laughs> <laughs> who thinks she had a night terror? Well, what did you dream, honey? And nobody, and it just made me think, okay, so this is a house where everybody is kind of double parked and nobody's really there for each other yeah. there. And, and uh, maybe it also helps to like, <laughs> I mean, without getting too personal, there was a time in my, uh, upbringing where, the, uh, you know, I had a picture 
like, you know, on the surface of it, kind of picture perfect, like, you know, nuclear family. And then there were disconnects and there were times where it was hard. So I'm just kind of, and I know yeah. how that can happen without but, you concentrating on it. It's actually easier to shut yourself off. But the thing it, is, so the, the that, thing is, is yeah. it, this is like, this is not like a disconnect from like, by actually like implementing a disconnect and showing us a disconnect. This is a disconnect based on an, an absence of um, screen time or just like, other like characters <laughs> interacting with each other because I don't think that like like most of the time like she just takes off with the kids and they're gone during the day and then also the fact that like during the night which is like most of the scene the scenes take place they're all like sleeping and he's fucking like running around with a baseball bat he's like falling out of the attic with shit like <laughs> dropping and nobody gets up nobody wakes up at any point and it's just like I don't I like did he drug them uh, like I, they just don't feel like no. real people to me at all. <laughs> okay. We know that the daughter uh, that, drugs that, him, but it's just like yes, what? we do. It, <laughs> That's way later. I just feel like there because there's like we we with the family we mostly just like hear about things because it's just like even like the thing with the uh, Trevor at school. It's just like and and even with that character, there was no reason for him to be drawing that on the board unless we're to believe that Bagul kind of like got to him too and then it was just sort of like a vetting yeah. process of less like which is the weaker minded of the two that we can kind of like exploit well the fact that they're also the saying that his that his night terrors were never this bad that they're getting so bad and also the second time he had the night terror he was just outside kind of shivering in the bushes i thought the one of him erupting from the box that came first was a lot more terrifying because yeah. there was no screaming in the second one he didn't he, he just seemed shaking and like maybe you just need to wake him up and take him so i don't know anyway they, but the way they were talking about it it seemed like he's getting worse the little girl is obviously detaching and oh because yeah there was another moment where she brought ellison the um uh, little uh, uh uh ashley brought ellison mm -hmm. tea i think and it's just this long shot down the other end of the hall she knocks 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 on the door she says here mommy says, you want me to give you tea or something like that and he just takes it like thanks a lot sweetie and just shuts the door in her face yeah. and i feel like cinematically what you're trying to tell me is he is becoming so uh, engrossed in this, in studying these movies, these Super 8 movies, for yeah. his own benefit, for his own selfish purposes, that he is completely denying the fact that there is uh, any, or not even denying, just inattentive to the fact that he has a family anymore. It's almost like him okay. losing his grip on his family is no, totally. damning, is damning like that. No, I, I get that. I okay, I, and I agree. Yeah. Here, okay, but here's an example because yes. um, they, uh, Scott Derrickson, the writer-director, he like largely uh, mentions The Shining as being an influence here. I get that. Um, <laughs> there, there's a lot of influences, but he, he mentioned The Shining quite a bit. He even showed yeah. The Shining to several of the cast members uh mm. even showing like specific parts of the movie like where danny in the shining like has that when he sees the the sisters in the hallway the first time and has that like look of terror on his face and he's just like said to the that child actor who played trevor just like i want you to like get that expression or just things like that so i don't think mm. that there's no problem with ethan hawk or ethan hawk's character in this movie in fact like ethan hawk like is phenomenal in this movie and interestingly yeah, yeah. enough um, the Black Phone, which is coming out this year uh, with Ethan yeah. Hawke, is also from this same writer director, so they're they're reaching yeah. for that. Um, and it has and it has um, a, a deputy so and so in it also, James uh, Ransone, who played who's Eddie in It Chapter in Two. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, yeah, like I said, there's no problem with that character. Like he has, like he's a very fleshed out. Like we know everything about him. Like he's interesting. I enjoy watching him, but he's. A lot of the times, like, we're not really seeing him through, like, those moments of him just, like, neglecting the family. We're just kind of seeing him, like, wander, like, kind of acting on his own or just, like, wandering down a dark mm -hmm. hallway and, like, reacting to noises and lights going out and, and things like that. Which, I mean, is all well and good, but, like, that kind of occupies most of the screen time. And I mm -hmm. feel that just because we we don't have the, the like, rest of the family to deal with. Uh, when you're comparing it to The Shining, if like if the director is using that as kind of a template, when you look at The Shining, you have Jack Nicholson as uh, Jack Torrance, and it's just like, yeah, like that's a great performance. But you also have two other really great performances from Shelley Duvall mm -hmm. as Wendy and uh, uh, Danny Lloyd as as Danny Torrance. So yeah. it's just like there's no, and that, that's a really long movie too. Just just to be fair. 
so they do get a lot of time separately. But I mean, still, like, if you're going to use the shunning as a template, like, you need to pay attention to the other members of the family because you have to like how does this affect them what's i want to see what their story is too and not just ellison's because i think that yeah. like bagul is like he's not just affecting ethan hawk's character he's affecting the entire family as evidence by the fact that like the kid is having night terrors and things like that so yeah. it's just like i want to see how they're all processing this i don't want to just see ethan hawk as much as great as Ethan Hawke's performance is throughout this, it's just like, sure, give me sure. something else. And uh, I know that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> because I'm going on, um, I was uh, going on a bit long. No, no, no. But again, like different ways of saying the same thing. Because I totally understand what you're saying here, and I think I even agree. The thing is, I think it's just phrased differently for me. Um, but we're just splitting hairs. But what I will say is, <laughs> something occurred to me while I was watching the film that again, it played well enough for the film because because I actually didn't have a problem with the actress playing... I always forget her name, though. I know Wendy's name till the day I die in Shining, but, okay, Tracy. Tracy yeah. is the wife's name. So, <laughs> um, I I didn't really find a fault with the way she was portraying anything, I thought, especially, like, when they have their confrontation, she's there, mm -hmm. but I genuinely believed that anytime she had concerns and she was sharing them with him, that she actually had these concerns, and for whatever reason, she was just kind of, like, pushing them aside and putting them to bed. He keeps telling me he's changed and that it's going to be different this time and I just have to wait it out, but I, when I tell him I have concerns, I don't get the same thing. He doesn't internalize anything that I say it just kind of he just he just argues with me because ultimately the most important thing for him is like and this is yeah. what she comes to realize is that uh he's the most important person in the family and his agenda and his life are really the only ones that matter and also that he's made a case in his head that like he's doing this for them which yeah. is a lie but um but the thing about her the way she was written that was the issue i took because i felt like she's essentially a non-character defined solely by her relationship like to her children and to her husband mm -hmm. we never get to know who she is apart from that here he's the soul of an artist and you know like and all this you know it yeah. is my life's blood I, you understood that and everything and She's basically like the wife, you know, and the yeah. mother and always speaks from that point of view. So we never really do get to know her. And even though I do believe and and even beyond believe, like I understand why she would be care about her family as much as she does. It feels like a trapping because I checked. I was like, I think men wrote this and I was right. It was C. <laughs> Robert Cargill and Scott Derrickson, like you said. And while I don't think she was, I would never say she was poorly written because mm -hmm. I think her point of view is there and I think the actress found it and played it. I don't think she's poorly written. I think she's predictably written yeah. because we never do get to know her any, anywhere beyond those roles that she plays. Yeah. So uh, that's my it, agreeing it, with you. <laughs> no, 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 okay. no, no. Yeah, basically you're right. Like this is kind of like the same opinion, but a different way of saying it. I don't yeah, like yeah, I yeah. think that she does a really good job like that scene where they're yeah. they have that confrontation like they're both doing yes. really well but it's still like it's that disconnect of just like who is this like your British girlfriend who's looking after your kids or she's like the <laughs> nanny or whatever but um but you're totally right in the, in the in the sense that like every time that we kind of do see like maybe some sort of uh like sense of uh, empowerment or just like I'm this is what I'm going to, like she says, there's an early scene where she's just like, if this doesn't work out, I'm taking the kids and I'm going yeah. back to live with my sister. And he's yeah. just kind of like schmoozing and joking. And she's like, e -he -he -he. And, and it's like, so every time she brings up a concern, he just, yeah. and maybe this speaks more to his, his, his like manipulation and, and all that yeah. shit. Like, cause, you know, he's a fucking like textbook narcissist, uh, if I've ever seen one, but uh, sure. <laughs> it's, it, it's almost like, there was a, there was like a crack for her to slip through and be a character, and yeah. she just never took it. Like every time there was the opportunity, and it's funny that you bring that up is the fact that it is to male writers because during the um, the second commentary, the one with both writers, the other yeah. guy, um, not the director, um, he he See makes a Robert lot of references. Cargill. He makes yeah. a lot of references to his wife and just like, not in like a bad way or anything, but he's okay. just like, it's just like more so just like kind of um, like off the cuff, just just making jokes about like when he and his wife argue or just like, you know, when she gets mad at him about. So it's just like, it, it almost seems like that makes sense as to why she was written 
that way because he just wrote he has this perspective of how women react to men doing yeah. like stupid things that that was kind of like how they perceived this character and the only way that she could be played sure um, I, I yeah i agree um, um first were, note you, first wait first note i wrote about tracy actually was tracy's voluntary enthusiastic ignorance period no <laughs> sentence that was all i wanted to remark well it was almost uh, like it, and it's funny because like go, there's the scene at the be- beginning when she says like oh please tell me we didn't move two houses down from a murder house. I know. <laughs> I, it's almost like she knew it was like this self-fulfilled prophecy, but it just like, yeah. does she not know her husband enough to know that like, <laughs> no, we were moving into the actual murder house. Right. Um, but that's <laughs> like when he finally like reveals that at the end, she's like, technically you didn't say, like you asked if we moved <laughs> down there. <laughs> just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we moved into like the fucking house. <laughs> and I, yeah, right. I, I know that that part is not like played for laughs, but I, I found it particularly funny. <laughs> it's yeah, just like, it, it, it's just you like, can laugh at it. Or, or he's like, they didn't, they weren't murdered here. It happened in the backyard. Um, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> were you, Which does feel very male to me. What? <laughs> yeah. Were you aware of the deleted scenes? Cause I know like I, no, I bought the, no, no, the Blu-ray no, no. and I was watching those. You streamed it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So there was there was two scenes deleted, or like two and a half, um, which had an entirely new character, or I guess removed character, played by oh. Angela Bettis. Oh, Bettis, oh, I love uh, her of uh, of TV Carrie fame. Yes. played Carrie in the and TV May. movie and, and May, May the movie. Um, she played the neighbor, and this was like mind blowing to me when I first saw that because it's just like they have a neighbor because I when I first saw the right. house because they don't show any establishing houses no. anywhere like we see the street and it looks like they're in the countryside like they're far away from, from like anything. in the middle but of nowhere like, yeah literally like a house right next door and we first see her we don't we're not introduced to her but we see her when he's bringing the son back inside after his little episode and she's just yeah. looking through the window and she like closes the the curtains and then the next um. day um after the family leaves he's just standing in the backyard looking at the tree and she comes wandering out there's not even a fence separating their property like that's how close this house <laughs> is to them and she is and she, it, this is a very interesting character and they said that they removed these scenes i guess mostly for time but also because they felt it wasn't needed i think that there's like other reasons for it like she's kind of like acting on like a, a frequency that is like completely different than his. But I mean, like I'm upset that they removed her stuff because it's like, she was a very interesting character. Like she was kind of this like neurotic busybody neighbor. Cause she like, she first approaches him and, and she's just like, if you're not going to learn anything by looking at that tree, if like the police didn't like all that time. And, and she kind of like, she's sort of like this pers- uh, perspective of just like, yes, this was a real family that lived here and, like, my husband and I knew them. And, like, she even said, like, um, uh, like, I'll tell you anything you want to know because, like, he was like, do you mind if I ask you some questions? And she's like, yeah, I'll tell you anything. But, like, after my husband leaves because he really liked them and he's not a fan of you moving in here and profiting off of their um, their murder. That is so cool. Yeah. Oh, my I, God. I, so they got rid of that. So she and she's really weird. She's just like... Like, I have, I have to make sure my husband's gone. Like, it, just the way she played it, it was it was it was very okay. bizarre. So I think that like I don't know if they got rid of it because like he said that she was a personal friend of his, um, oh, the, okay. the actress. Um, so I, he didn't like say like yeah, I just didn't. He was like oh yeah, they had really good chemistry and not I, I don't know. I just saw her like they were. She was so like far out. Like it was almost like this was her movie now, and she was like I'm gonna oh. steal this the show from Ethan Hawke and. <laughs> She's, like, in her kitchen, like, pouring coffee and just, like, talking to him, but not actually looking at the coffee. And she, like, overflows it. And she's just, like, yeah, like, really nice family. But that little girl was, like, weird. And I guess, like, he, the director said that's why they cut it. Because it's, like, they, it was, like, we were already setting up what we found out later of just, like, the, the possibility sure. of the little girl. Sure. But even, and and I guess, like, the reason, another reason why is because, like, they wanted it to be very... Like a like an isolated movie like with Shining. Ethan Hawke yeah. of just like not having these other people here, but it's just like a lot of this movie feels like it's 
a murder mystery because we don't know. I mean, like clearly it's presented that there's a supernatural element, but we don't know a hundred percent if that's supernatural or that's Ethan Hawke, like having like a, a psychotic breakdown or oh. disassociating or whatever. So I mean, it's, <laughs> it, you know, but it was sort of a ways like, you know, if, if it was a murder, like, you know, they were murdered by a flesh and blood human. Here's a red herring. Um, in, in the neighbor, there's a red herring in the sheriff or the, the deputy so-and-so, or just like, you know, Mm -hmm. like just having these characters, you know, if the movie had spent more time just developing that, like, this is a community and this is like, this was a murder that like happened in this like peaceful community, that would have been interesting. Like, I would have liked to see it from that angle rather than like, I get what they, and not to say that it wasn't successful by just kind of like isolating it to just inside the house. Because yeah. like the movie does a really good job of of like even just showing, like mm-hmm. like uh, uh like cinematically, um just like how dark this is and how like the spaces just like feel like there something could pop out anywhere. So like it's successful in the regard, regard that you know they have a very self isolated movie. But I would have liked to see that movie instead of just like here's a town that's kind of like you know. Mm. full of people and they don't like the fact that this guy has moved in and yeah. you know some might be because it's like you're bringing unnecessary attention to to our community you're exploiting a murder sure. but also maybe the real murderer is still out there and they want to and they don't want to be discovered or something like that yeah it's, if you're suspect if you're suspected to be like a mystery like the way the way you're talking along those lines then yeah, yeah. that is definitely the stronger choice to create a community that yeah. is antagonizing and that doesn't the necessarily mean that it doesn't it still doesn't have to be revealed that it was right, the, right. the kid that that murdered right, them at right. the end and it was because of this like supernatural deity and all that shit but it was just like it would have <laughs> added more texture to the to the overall movie mm-hmm. and more character and more things like this. so that's that's kind of where i just jumping back to what i said at the beginning that's what i think is missing here for me at least oh. and why this isn't a like a great movie is compared to just a good movie so i think that if those were kind of the choices that they made and maybe like looked at this script and did like a rewrite or two that it could have been improved okay that's interesting because uh now we'll start saying different things different ways but <laughs> okay good <laughs> because I, I i see what you, i see what you're saying i don't disagree with that it's just not what struck me about what needed to be changed because also you're talking to someone who one thing I love about like potentially like haunted environments or you know uh, possessed environments or you know places that are going to go wrong and that'll go sour you know like the wife says. Um, yeah. I love the fact that like the family shows up and they're all talking about like it's going to be different this time and I know no it isn't and I'm <laughs> I I get incredibly superstitious not in my life but as a moviegoer I love knowing that. There's a big bad, a big supernatural bad, and you are like walking right into the mouth of the beast, and uh, by the end of it, you're going to be in the belly, you know. And um, so I, I didn't, I didn't need like the, I, I didn't require the community. I can see what you're talking about, but I, what I liked about it was just the fact that. Um, I was watching the inevitable kind of like you know like I, I, I don't know. There's something about the inevitability of evil consuming. Um, shall we say ignorance or innocence or un, un, unassuming people? Let's just people. M- mash them <laughs> together and say ig- ignincence. Ignincence. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're kind of both. Yeah. But um, for, so for me, like the ride of the supernatural and everything like that, um, I think the problem I had with it that felt like the most like a problem aside from the wife's role was the fact that um, by the time... Things re- I mean, it feels like things unravel quite a bit, and it's not like it's un- ineffective. I feel like the cinematography, you mentioned how dark it is, and even with the lighting, it is an incredibly mm-hmm. dark film, but not in like a scrophorum kind of way where, you know, because <laughs> it is dark during the day. Anytime they Scream see Scream four for house, anyone who doesn't understand. Because scroph- right. there's a four in the A. Anyway, yeah. so <laughs> when we talk knew- about it, you'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. But so they're but they're like literally like just shafts of light like coming booming and making them almost silhouettes in their own kitchen while they're yeah. having conversations during daylight and I like it because it makes yeah. me feel like they are they're basically just kind of like tucking away in this cave like 
you know, like like looming um, um, fortress. And the fortress isn't necessarily the house, but it's just the energy and the fact that they've got caught in the web, as it were. That's yeah. what I like. Mixing metaphors, well, th- that's what I like. I yeah. think that, like, it just... Because it's funny that you mentioned that, because, like, while I was watching it, I was thinking of Scream 4 a lot, um, especially ah. in those scenes, like... Uh, in the Robert's house. Like, you know, when, when Sydney uh, has that exchange with Judy uh, that yeah. one time. And I've just like, it's like, here's a very, it's it's like a house that doesn't need to be as dark as it is, but it's just like, just to set the mood, like we are going to have like all these dark spaces all over the place where, you know, people can, mm-hmm. can jump out. And I think that these are two areas where I think that the, the film does really successfully because like, unlike Scream 4, like that didn't do anything for the movie mm. thematically like they could should have just stuck with what they had already done with screams one to three whereas here like you said it's just like it's you know presents this environment that's like a like a tucked away in this this cave-like thing so it, it's it works on a on a thematic level and that's yeah. where i think like one area where i think that the film did really well is just in, in terms of of the lighting especially just like the how everything was lit there's that one part of the movie where um, he goes to uh, sleep on the couch while he's holding the bat, and we see the sunrise come up. Um, I guess like sped up, yeah. And just like the, the way that they did that, it, like it looked so authentic and yeah. like real. Even though it's just like we're not seeing like a time lapse or anything. It's just like just the, to show like it's now like the sun is peeking out. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of this movie is just like it's it's that movie magic where it looks like it's daylight outside and they're just like no that we shot this at night but like you know just to to give it the appearance yeah. um and then the other uh area and i don't know if i'm jumping ahead or if because we can still go back to to more of the cinematography here is just the the score and the sound design yes. especially the sound design yes. and um Funny enough, uh, the score uh, was uh, composed by one of my favorites, uh, um, uh, Christopher, Christopher Young. Young, uh, thank you. As I say, one of my favorites, and I forget his name, from <laughs> Hellraiser, like, Hellraiser 1 yeah. and 2, uh, mm-hmm. Urban Legend, uh, The mm-hmm. Grudge. 1 so, and 2. <laughs> 1 and 2, yeah. Well, yeah. We don't need to talk about The Grudge. We don't even need to talk about The Grudge. But... <laughs> I'm sorry, Eric. But... Um... <laughs> It's it, it's 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 it was a nice welcome addition. Um, yeah. And this is especially because like so much of the the movie and like what makes it scary is in the sound. And as we know by Halloween and John Carpenter, it's like ninety five percent of it is in what you hear. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um. I especially I think I think the first time I mean I noticed it in initially with that first Super Eight film that we see with the family hanging, which we didn't talk about that. Like I think that's an incredibly strong way to just kind of like set mm-hmm. some tension right off the bat, where I'm just like, oh fuck, it's grainy as fuck. There's like this mystery family with sacks over their heads, and now the limb is lowering, and they're all hanging, and it's all moving as if they were underwater, like in this dreamlike kind of uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, energy that it just makes it even better. And then there's this strange, this curious music that doesn't do what I oftentimes fault horror scores for doing, which it, I don't feel like it's telling me, you're watching something spooky. I mean, <laughs> it definitely has its more traditional moments of the score, kind of like with you know, maybe Ethan Hawke moving around the house or something like that. But yeah. it's never ineffective. Or, or like the low moans or the voices and stuff like that. It, it yeah. always seems to just uplift. But because there's such variety, um, I really, really loved the pulsing. And I bring up like the house looking like a cave. There was this weird energy to that one first pulse when I think he's putting the projector together that feels like he's excavating almost like it's got this this driving beat behind it that's Mm -hmm. moving him inexorably toward like his destiny or something and i just love that and then once he starts the backyard super eight film when he starts watching it there's Mm -hmm. this almost bernard herman-esque score it felt like psycho kind of like that climbing that dun 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 Mm-hmm. It was almost like that, and it well, just, the uh, oh, the music that they it. used for, like the, the like any of the when the Super Eight videos, they actually yeah. that wasn't Christopher Young. They uh, got that from 
like they were like apparently scoured the internet just looking for oh, really? different bands of just of just like to kind of get a uh, oh my god the, the information here somewhere I'll, okay. I'll I'll look it up we can we'll we'll sure. get back to that but um <laughs> I, I, no, but something amazing. I did want to mention cuz you uh yeah. you you talked about the house and yeah they even mentioned this in the commentary one thing that I do really appreciate about this house is that it's not your typical haunted house mm. Um, I think the one that they go back, like the one that they do own, like the big one at the end, like that's more of like what you would yeah. get from a haunted house. But like this yeah. little bungalow, this like this ranch style home, like that's yeah. like you wouldn't drive by that and, and be like, like if it was like a, a horror movie and be like, that's a, a horror movie haunted house. But you might drive oh. by that and be like, that's a that is a place where like in real life a family was murdered. Um, yeah. So it and so that's another yes. thing. It just it, it yes. kind of like grounds this in reality, and that's a, another reason why I miss like all these characters and just just being there and like that there is a neighbor there because it just makes it feel more real. Another thing that I uh, really liked is, mm-hmm. and they they admitted to this too. They uh, they stole this out of Manhunter, uh, of just the oh the Super Eights because um, even like at the beginning with all the Super yes. Eight stuff, like like just watching the uh the the barbecues or the the pool parties and all that but especially the scene where they're going up the stairs so and the the parents are tied up in the bed uh is taken directly out of manhunter yeah. and it's um it's I, even i think it's the opening scene which isn't i don't think that i can't remember if like the killer was filming it as it happened but the the killer in in those mm-hmm. movies were like it was like there was this whole thing with like the home videos that the family would shoot and that's how they f- would find the killers so and manhunter obviously was uh, remade right. as red dragon to fit in with the uh the silence of the yeah. lambs timeline if, if you're unaware of either of those movies so hannibal lecter mm. um yeah but uh yeah, yeah it was definitely that that one bit there which i thought was really creepy because it's like here's just this like regular like american home and just like the the graininess of the the super eight and, yeah. and just like going up it just it just yes. felt very raw and gritty and just like and real which i mean yes very much so that's what i like because i mean it's it's funny because like we we talked about this in 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 texas chainsaw uh of just how like you know you have like these movies (laughs) that are just like they should be gritty but then there's like they're polished or just like in terms of like the remakes and the reboots Mm -hmm. whereas this is like a very polished movie but the juxtaposition of what we see in like the present day mixed in with what is like shown on the on the super eights it just it, this it makes this contrast that is very creepy and what mm-hmm. like you'd have to imagine is just like this this entire time these i mean we don't see it mm-hmm. but like they're being recorded too like they're on their own reel that we see at the end the uh, painting party or whatever it's called of 2012 yeah 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 um so that's that i mean that yeah (laughs) that is an exception you know if you want to have your your polished like 2000s looking movie but just like show that you know what's scary so i mean like going back to the forbes thing like you know maybe they're right maybe this is the scariest movie ever made i mean it (laughs) well okay like one thing i want to say about that um because we didn't really go into it uh uh, the reason I say no, like almost yeah. like reflexively, <laughs> is because I mean I think I'm gonna get to sleep okay tonight. I don't know. I didn't really carry this movie. I thought it was good. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I was looking forward to seeing what more you know these filmmakers uh, were gonna have. And now that I know the Black Phone is like on the horizon, because I I think it was supposed to release last year and maybe it didn't. So I guess yeah. now it's released. Whatever. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Let's just put it that way. And um, I. That all that said, the like greatest horror or the scary the scariest movie. Let's put it that way. The scariest movie is the one that I can't shake. The one that like I am like under my bed, just going under my covers in yeah. my bed, just going, oh shit, <laughs> why did I watch that? And I'm now okay. Time to put on something that's fun, but not too much fun because I don't want to be watching it. Ironically, yeah. when whatever is coming to I get think me that... gets me. No, no, no. Uh, I, you know, I, I agree. This is. I, it's not my scariest movie, but obviously in terms of like the consensus yeah. of whatever uh, the data is that, that Forbes collected, this is the scariest movie for right. for everyone. <laughs> um, but I think like where it where it misses the mark for me is just 
like you said, it, it is very basic. Like there's, there's th- this movie was a dime a dozen at the time. Like, cause you have your, um, your insidious and your conjuring and just like all these movies of the similar ilk that it's, it's, it's like, there's nothing that really stands apart from this one. I mean, I'm other than like, you know, some really great mm. cinematography and sound design and score um, and, you know, Ethan Hawke, uh, his performance is, is also, like, memorable. But it just, the story is very basic. And I feel that, you know, had they done, like, a certain thing just to make, like, to bring it into a, a realm of being, like, more psychological than just, like, straight up, like, uh. we're investigating this thing. Because, I mean, like, in terms of, like, if this was, like, a documentary or if I was just watching YouTube videos and they're just, like, talking about like murdered families and just like bagul because like the whole i'm fascinated by the whole thing of just like the family to get killed is they previously lived in the house where the another family was killed who then is just like this this chain Mm -hmm. like going back and back in time because i mean like they only go up to i think like sometime in the 60s but i mean like this could it could have gone on even further than that it could have been like a whole thing and like you know, even thinking to movies like Oculus of just like the the mirror, like this haunted mirror that's existed for so long. Like, uh-huh. I am like I'm fascinated by the mythology of of Bagul. We'll we'll, we'll say it that uh, way. I am too. Um, I, I, you actually made me think about two things. Like one thing that I was kind that I did find kind of fascinating as like an unexplored detail was just the fact that um, at the very end of the movie when Ashley possessed Ashley, Ashley gone wrong, is Mm -hmm. doing her little cartoon of her family. It's at the very bottom of the page and there's no more room left. And then at the very top of the page was the first family we know of that was caught in this. So whoever goes on next, maybe the only real paper trail, as it were, is going to go back to whoever moves into that house after the end of this movie. You know what I mean? So I liked that because it just kind of made me feel like, how many pages are there? Yeah. You know, because sounds like a very ancient deity. Yes. Do what? you did you see Sinister Two? I did, and I just remember the only thing about that one well, I remember. Is I, I haven't think, seen it, but I'm I'm, I'm interested. Okay, no, in no, no, no. I'm now. not gonna I'm not gonna say anything plot wise or anything like that. The only thing I remember is a feeling I had yeah. toward the third act that it had all gone wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, because I have no idea what's what about. I mean, want. I would just assume that just going by what's presented yeah. to us in this movie that the next movie would be a family moves into the 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 home yeah. of like of Ellison and at, like, at, the, at the we see at the end of the movie and then they just deal yeah. with like all the the haunting bullshit and then go to a new one or else right. it's it's like um a uh, prequel of just like the backstory of of which I mean oh, like God, I, I, hope. I hope not I don't think it is because <laughs> I looked at the cast and James uh Ronson is it reprises mm-hmm. his role so as deputy so and so so I'm just like I'm assuming it's uh um, the present day or, or like taking place like yeah continuation okay um, but I yeah I'm, I'm yeah, I don't interested remember. I'm, I'm I don't interested in the, in the mythology of of Bagul I, I want to know I don't want to know more but I want to like I I'm I want more to whet my appetite you know like I I don't want sure. I don't want to like have all the evidence presented to me because I feel like that's when things become not scary when you have all the facts but it's oh. just like I want to know that this is like this goes way further back because like we sort of get like there's the two scenes where he's on the the skype call with vincent d'onofrio uh, dr jonas yeah yeah uh where he's just kind of like professor professor jonas sorry professor jonas (laughs) (laughs) um i'm just like explaining like what this is and it's just like it's because he says something or or ethan hawk says just like well can't we just like destroy the images because he because jonas says like yeah bagul exists in the images like that's his gateway and and he's and he's like well can't we just destroy and he's like how do you mean and i just i thought that was funny because it's just like what do you mean like that was a pretty fucking straightforward question but okay (laughs) but because i think he thought that they were just discussing academia and legend and you know well because yeah because then he's because then he says like what kind of book are you writing um, right, right. But the but yeah, because what's interesting is the way that they make it sound is like this has been this is like a well known thing or like Bagul, the legend of him is is well known enough that like hundreds of years ago people were wise enough to know like we need to get rid of every trace of like 
picture or, mm-hmm. or photo or anything that could like have him come into our realm because that's how we, it's, it's almost like he's a Freddy Krueger in that way. It's just like the, the community of Springwood. Like we need to, we need to like make all the children forget because that's the only way that Bagul is going to come back. Which I mean, you I love that. The like last that's a, of the Elm Street children. That's a tried and true, <laughs> yeah. um, like storytelling device of, of, for horror films. So I'm, I, I don't mind well, that at all. Well, while we're discussing tried and true storytelling devices, because uh, one thing I don't know if this would make it less scary for you. I wonder if it would. But for me, uh, this is where because I didn't get to, to finish this. Uh, what the, the problem I had with the movie, as far as like the direction it went, was um, when finally uh, fucking Ellison decided now it's time to leave and <laughs> and I'm burning everything when why would you burn anything that is involved in any kind of like black magic or supernatural forces because fire does not destroy ever like a phoenix f- from the ashes it will mm-hmm. ru- you know like why would you ever t- tamper with that I mean granted he hasn't been making the best decisions up until then but the very the very fact that it didn't even occur to him and I remember this occurred to me during the movie and I didn't remember exactly what happened this time and then while I was watching I was just like oh yeah like I, I, I it just occurred to me every screening with this movie like why wouldn't you just naturally assume if there's an address that even two families have in common Mm -hmm. and you know you have this address in common with the last family who was staying there wouldn't you naturally go in that direction and start researching yourself or wait to hear from the deputy that like oh there is a connection they are all interconnected and if i move I'm going to continue the cycle. Ultimately, I will die. The only way, and see, that's why I started thinking, like, while you're driving away, talking to the sheriff and everything like that, why aren't you contacting Professor Jonas again and asking him, is there some kind of binding spell? Is there anything that anyone has ever done to try and stop the cycle? I mean, Ellison is not the fucking brightest. I mean, he might be a good (laughs) crime, like, story writer, writer. <laughs> yeah. um, but he is not bright and oh. this is actually okay and I, I find this really funny because like the the when he starts watching the the stuff or, or like going through the what he finds it's like he's yeah. making these notes like he just writes down and we see what he writes and he's just like where did the box come from? like just these very like yes like yeah. elementary questions <laughs> i'm just like it's it's like <laughs> What, is this your process? Like, I, the, the the thing that's like, and this is, I think this is a lot of what, like, what takes me out of the movie is just like, he doesn't really seem to question anything like weird. Like he just, he goes through, he, he, he goes down the rabbit hole, but he's never like, this is fucking weird. Like, and that's the problem is that he has no one to bounce that off of because we don't have like these characters that he can that he can talk to because the family is like a non-character yeah. but it's like at the beginning when you find this box i mean like because that's the question it's just like where did the box come from that should be your movie right there like not watching the fucking box i mean you can watch them but it's just like i want to know where this came from like that that's the biggest thing because clearly there are people who have been murdered on here going back to the 60s and this box mm-hmm. was left you would think that like the police emptied the house out entirely just searching for evidence so like why is this box here? Like, if it's not something supernatural, mm-hmm. which is something that you'd have to be looking into, then it's going to be, you know, like the killer, if it, if it is a flesh and blood killer. And I think that right. the point, uh, like when he calls the police and then they're like 911 operator and he's just like holding it and then he hangs up because <laughs> yeah. that was like kind of like the decision, like where the character makes a bad decision in a movie. Like, it's just I'm like, going to take this on myself. Yeah. Yeah. And like, um, not also, only that, but why yeah. the cops wouldn't like call him back? And because you know they do that if you call the cops and hang yes. up their they're, they're like, we're, we have a squad car on our way there. Do you want to just like exp- like is everything okay? Like sort of thing. So right. that like yeah, yeah, yeah. first thing that was like not realistic, but just then like everything after that of just like not really qu- like just questioning like what's going on here because I mean like he when he moved into that house, you'd have to yeah. think that he didn't he wasn't expecting there to be like these super eight tapes he just thought that he was gonna like get engrossed in like there was no evidence to speak of he was just writing a book so it's Mm -hmm. it's almost like what was the what was what was he gonna do there if this fucking box had never appeared uh seek inspiration in the environment of the the massacre (laughs) or not the massacre but you know what i mean like the, the bloody 
<laughs> the bloody backyard of it all. But totally. uh, it's because it's it's interesting because also it just occurred to me it's making me like the, him less. Certainly, I don't really <laughs> like him, but it's it's and it might it might make me like the movie less. Um, oh, but no. I still accept. I still no. I still accept it for what it is. But because now I'm just thinking in terms of here is a man who never who never really confides in his wife. Or, or his children. Granted, they're pretty young. But I mean, you know, everybody's kind of anxious to be seen, to share, to be a part of his life. And he pushes them away. And who is the person he finally fucking confides in? The the deputy who's a fan who wants a fucking autograph. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That seems very telling. But also the fact that, like, he said... I, I can't remember if it was in that exchange with uh, Deputy So-and-So or if it was with... Um, the uh, with uh, Professor Jonas, I, I think it was Professor Jonas, where he full on says that the only survivors or the missing persons at every one of these uh, uh, situations that he's studying, the crime scenes, uh, have disappeared and they always seem to be children. Mm -hmm. And here he's curious about the lore because all the supernatural shit is starting to happen to him that he can't explain, that he isn't sharing with anybody. And he... It just made me wonder, like, did it never once occur to you that in the midst of all of this stuff that's going on that you have nothing but questions about, if there is some kind of evil force, if there is, it might go after your children? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the fact that that wasn't even a concern. May and maybe he was just... Also, maybe this is like a product of being a little too derivative of The Shining, because in The Shining, we kind of understand what's happening to Jack Torrance with the hotel that he is ultimately being consumed by it. But in this case, he's there. there maybe it's sometimes it's scarier if there's mystery and it's not completely explained. Yeah. But I mean, he's just kind of a desperate man who, who trusts no one except for people who are willing to just like, yeah. you know, everything is like out of, <laughs> out of like selfish desire. Like he's obsessed yeah. with himself. Like he's watching fucking like old videotapes of himself. <laughs> With That'd be like, loathing. and he's <laughs> what? Yeah, he's watching them. He's like rolling his eyes at them, but it's just like, yes. but like drinking. It's just like, I don't. <laughs> I hate watching like old videos of my like you know after I've like edited them and maybe yeah. if I've watched them again once like in a, a week or so just just to, like recap and it's just like if I watch something that like you know I made six months ago or more I'm just like oh god I don't I don't want to watch this like I I can't watch myself he's sitting there and just like this is his inspiration it's like you know he might be like you fucking idiot like you were a fool back then but but we know better now you know <laughs> kentucky blood whatever the fuck his book is called. right <laughs> yes um no but you're no I he's, have, he's yeah. the worst he's the fucking worst and even the mother <laughs> like because that girl is yeah. like she drew like painted on her wall like the the hanging family from the tree. Yes. And it's just like, yeah. we know that the girl is allowed to paint in her room. But I mean, like, yeah. are we are we to know that, like, the mother didn't go in there and be like, what's this? Especially since the son drew the yeah. same thing on the chalkboard and got sent home yeah. or got in, reprimanded for it at school. So it's just like, yeah, she's more concerned about the fact that she painted on the wall in the hallway. <laughs> but not so much like what was painted in in the bedroom. So it's like both yeah, there's of these no parents active, love. Like both of them suck. Yeah, really. there's no active parenting going on from either one of them. She no. gets to vocalize a lot of her concern about her children. But I, I mean, it, I think if she really did have that level of concern, she would have just taken the kids and drove them. And then finally when he's ready, when he's, he's like, okay, let's get out. She's like, you're scaring me. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> this is what you were waiting for. It's yeah. your window. Um, but um, and I, not I only that, that but like, what is yeah, the, ahead, what his ahead. breaking point for like when it, it was like scared to like have to leave was, was that like the shit falling like not even falling but it was like thrown out like there was f physically something was up there that mm -hmm. like picked up this thing and threw it out there. There was a moment that I really liked though, uh, which was right yeah. before that when he gets up and he goes into his office and the projector is gone, but he kind of like moves his hand across the the little tabletop there almost to like it's like yeah. is it there like am i just not seeing it sort of thing just that i liked because that's like we're we're going back to the idea of like just playing with his mind psychologically is this him yeah or is it an actual yeah. thing and i and he uh, they actually said that that was ethan hawk's decision to do that so it's like nice. ethan hawk knew like what movie this should have been i don't know why the <laughs> the writers and the director didn't 
Um, I did have a question for you because yeah. I know in uh, off pod we've had conversations before about uh, where I'll ask you like in a case of a movie just like you know okay there's like two paths and there's like there's the scary one and there's like the non scary one which one are you going to and you've said like oh I'm not a scary one like but like totally like that's more interesting like whatever yeah. and I'm like I don't understand you so I wanted to know first of all would you ever move into that house <laughs> knowing what I, happened there I think that I mean like. Just putting myself in Ellison's shoes. Yeah. I think I would. Um, Because, you know, I have to, I'm I'm not just speaking for myself here. I'm like, as as his character. Um, Yeah, I would totally, you know, and if I'm that kind of person like he is, I, you know, and knowing that my wife wouldn't like knowing about it, I'd probably lie about it too. But there's, but in terms of like the decisions that he makes throughout, I mean, like the... It's the thing that's just like crazy to me is that like that he did hang up that that phone call to the police because it's like you have yeah. evidence here of mm-hmm. like not just one murder but and not just like five murders but five different events of multiple murder like there's at least twenty people or not uh, you know probably around, uh, about twenty people that have been murdered and yeah, sure you're like holding on to this for yourself and you're not really doing anything that's like giving you the answers like he like he's giving like these vague descriptions to so and so and he's doing all the legwork for him like like if anything like deputy so and so is the one that's like uncovering this crime yeah, he's the totally. one that figures out the the backtracking of the of the map of all the mm-hmm. murders so it's just like it you know i mean i guess like for for reasons that he didn't want to get the the police department like actually involved and have this become like their investigation. He was careful about what to say, but it's like, it's like in that way, it's just like what, I don't know what his plan was. It was just sort of like, all it was, was just like, he was writing this book, but he didn't really have any, like anything to write other than like, what would he say? I moved into this house and there was this in a box that was inexplicably placed there. And I watched (laughs) these videos. Like that's not a, that's not a like true crime story. That's uh Mm. I mean, that's that's basically your word against like like everything else of just being like, oh, yeah, this this really happens. It's an urban legend at that point. And And you just made me think like he never once suspects that it's like planted there by someone who doesn't want him in the house. Yeah, that's another thing that would have been interesting to bring up. It's just like a a reason for disbelief. Like there are people who don't want you here. Maybe somebody just put this here to scare the shit out of you and get you to move. But that I think that's the thing because it's like it's it's is it true crime or is it an urban legend? And they don't really explore that or at least like he doesn't explore that. He just Mm -hmm. like spends the entire movie like meandering through the house reacting to shit <laughs> and i mean that's it gets frightening because of the use it's of, well done, of yeah. sound and yes. and uh the cinematography <laughs> but yeah. it's like but in terms of the story like it's it's a little empty and i feel like we're, we're just going around in circles at this point we're saying the same thing <laughs> <laughs> over and over um but uh one thing that i because i don't want to like I, I feel like i have been very negative towards uh this director and i you know, I, it, it's just in terms of the screenplay, because I do think that, like, technically this, this movie is great. Um, and one thing mm-hmm. that I did want to point out that he, uh, like, a decision that he made creatively uh, in terms of, like, the, the clues throughout the movie is that when he, we were watching the Super 8 footage, there are certain scenes where the camera's shaky, like someone's holding it, and then there are scenes where it's just still, like it's on a tripod. And yes. we, if you watch it, you can see that when it is shaky, the child, like the missing child, isn't in the shot because they're the ones yeah. holding it. But then when it's stationary, the child is there. So he's like, that was the first clue that he put in there that you, like, you should know that, like, it's the child who's who's mm-hmm. the killer or, or, or the one watching them. And then of course the other one is like when they he finds the the cover of the the box with like all the uh, the drawings of just like mommy and daddy and mr boogie mm-hmm. um just, <laughs> yeah i also like the fact that um bagul has kind of like predecessors like almost like here's your first level kind of like threat like almost like you're like you know like it's 
uh, I, I can't put it any other way than like almost like harbingers of doom. And the first one is the scorpion in the attic, and then there's the snake in the attic, and then mm-hmm. finally there's the Rottweiler in the backyard before you get the big bad, which is, is the ghoul himself. Okay, I, I completely yeah. forgot about the Rottweiler because I because I was seeing that I'm just like getting flashbacks of the Omen, but the way totally. that they made it, <laughs> it, it just seemed like it was like a like now knowing it in the context that there were deleted scenes and that there was like a full neighborhood around them. Uh-huh. I'm just because the dog like it kind of like it has this like standoff with him, but then it's just like okay, I'm gonna go over here and play. Um, so you know, <laughs> watching that like with the deleted scenes in mind, I just see that as like it wasn't like a harbinger of of the evil of Bagul. It was just sort of like a neighbor's dog, and he was freaked out. He was already on edge, and he had the bat. What I thought was <laughs> hilarious and I, like actually annoying, really, is that like when the dog ran away because he was like really trying to get that bat. The dog runs yeah. away, and he just darts into the house, just like pick up the fucking bat. You're gonna need. That's that. what I thought too. Yeah, I thought that too. But like, he, we're not supposed Strode. to be on his side. <laughs> we're not supposed to be on his side. But no. um, I also um, there was something uh, I, 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 I wanted to comment on. Oh, because we're talking about strengths. Like another thing you mentioned uh, very early about like uh, doing uh, jump scares right. One of the most effective jump scares for me, and it, it I, it's. Com- completely attributed to all of the the ingredients just like in a recipe for success was um the, i don't even remember what the title of the uh super eight uh can was but it was the one where they had the lawnmower just running running yeah. running 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 and you know something's gonna happen then it, then all of a sudden there is a head and it's it's the seeing ahead it's the dramatic sting that they do. And you know me, I'm not a big fan of dramatic stings. Ooh, look how spooky. Mm-hmm. It jarred me to my core. I was like, ah! I, th- I yeah. screamed out loud. And then the fact that my very reaction was shared by Ethan Hawke, because immediately he's like, ah! You know, whatever. Yeah. I, 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 that, I, I, that that gave me a lot of happy. Well, I think a, a that, lot like... Of the, a lot of, yeah. Well, I was yeah. going to say two things about that. Like, for, like the, the lawnmower jump scare in itself, like, that's effective because it's doing this thing where normally, like, it, it's kind of like like a rhythmic thing where you're just, like, you, you can time exactly when the jump scare is going to come. It'll just be, like, one, yeah. two, three, and then nothing <laughs> happens. And then we go on to, like, four, five, and, like, bah! So yes. <laughs> it's, like... They're, they and they and he does that a lot. Uh, the, this director in the in the movie, not to a point where it's like yeah. it's predictable because it's like it gets you every time. But there's like one uh, when he does go up into the attic and all the kids are sitting there watching the the Super Eight, and mm-hmm. it has the like it shows Bagul like up close, but then it cuts back to like further like a further away shot. So you see like yeah. all the kids sitting there and like Bagul like in the background like on the screen as I like put my camera out of focus here um and it's just like your naturally like your eyes will go to that part like you you look like deeper into the picture and then yes bagul like jumps in front of the the thing and like that gets yes, you exactly. and shit like that like so there were a lot of jump scares even though i had seen this movie and i wasn't necessarily scared but just in terms mm-hmm. of like it's like the video those videos on on youtube or tiktok or whatever the fuck they do the vine um yes, of just yes. they're like look here and then the, the screaming yeah. head pops up and and like and i like know a lot to that. pull the f- yeah to pull my yeah. phone away and just have it like uh you know like because I, I that you're not and it doesn't me. it's not scary <laughs> but it like it's startling <laughs> for sure yeah it jolts so maybe you, this is yeah okay so maybe this isn't the scariest movie of all time but it's the most startling i'll, I'll give it that most um, jarring yeah <laughs> but um but and I, then there's, another there's a Yes, go ahead, go oh, ahead. Um, there's a, another thing I was going to say to that. Oh, yeah, the um, we his reaction to seeing things. Because that's another yeah. thing that I think they do really effectively here is that, like, this isn't a gory or bloody movie by any means at all, um, which mm-hmm. is funny because I think they were they were trying to get a PG-13 and they still got an R based off of content. Um, but this, we don't really see anything because it cuts away at that point and we're mostly seeing his reaction. Um, and then there's also the scene where like the throats are slit and we don't see it happen, but we sort of see it in the reflection of his, his, uh, frames, uh, his glasses. I think it's because it's families. I think that's why. Yeah. It's a little, it's it's a little, of the murders. I like, I know they had like, Uh, they had some trouble like getting the the movie greenlit because they had to like 
explain like it wasn't because they're just like you're killing children they're like no we're not we're killing families um and that's how they like <laughs> that's how they sold it um wow but I and did, the thing I, that actually horrified me the most was not not anything that happened to any of the people. This is how you know I'm a pet owner. Yeah. That one chihuahua for the family that was all yeah. tied to their beds and everything. And the little chihuahua is just sitting there, not tied up or anything, just sitting there barking and looked so lost. Like, like what are you doing? And What's they didn't want to have that in there. Like, the, the producers were like, no, we're not putting the fucking dog in there. But he, like... Really, like oh. he's like, no, like get the dog, like trust me, it'll be good. And if you don't like it, yeah, like, it's I'll, chilling. I'll pay it for my it. Heart. Like it, it was my like heart. it cost six thousand dollars to to hire that dog, and then they're like <laughs> they ended up using it because they liked it. So he didn't have good. to pay for it out of his own pocket. It made it feel um, more like a home, and it made it feel more invasive and terrible yeah. in a great way. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So and this was uh, Jason Blum. This was a like an early Blum House yeah. before it was titled yeah. Blum House, I, I think. Yeah. Um, so actually, like very low budget. Um, mm -hmm. But they they were just on the subject of the jump scares. The one that is actually shown in the trailer of uh, the screen when when Ethan Hawke just turns away and Bagul's image on the screen like kind of turns towards him. That was yeah. in the trailer, and I guess like. Uh, Scott Derrickson like lobbied hard for like like that to not be in the trailer because you know at that mm. point like he he had final cut on the film but he didn't have it with like w whatever the marketing is um, sure. so I guess like uh, Jason Blum said to him it was just like it's one of those things like it'll get more like people in seats to see the movie and he like he was quoting Jason Blum here just saying that like most people don't remember jump scares that they see in the trailers anyway once they're in the movie. And I've never disagreed with anything more in my life. And it is a prime example. Yeah. And I just, like, Halloween 2018, I'm sorry, I always... I was just going to say, I was just going to say, the yes. closet, And just, like, in terms of, like, yeah. another Blumhouse movie, it's just, like, you really need to get off of that mindset, Jason Blum. Because yeah. that is that is not how the audience sees it. Like... People are savvy. Be I mean, like even back in 2012, because we're we're 10 years in the future from that point. But even then, yeah. like, you know, we have the technology. We can go through a trailer and we can pause it and we can go back and watch it several times. So it's just like, yeah. we're not going to, if especially nowadays when everything is like so overanalyzed yes. that, you know, people watch trailers a hundred times before they see a movie. Like yeah. they're going to remember a scene like that. So I, yeah. I, I disagree with that. Um, I absolutely disagree with that. What a what a horribly ignorant thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, he should move into a murder house. But, <laughs> <laughs> that I, mean, I would watch that movie. Jason Blum <laughs> yeah, right. moves into it's like, like Sinister Jason Three. <laughs> I like him, but um, yeah, and and I, I I do have to say, like, I mean, it sounds like. It probably sounds like we're complaining about a lot of things, but that's movie discussion. You, you yeah. talk about the things that work and the things that don't work, but it's just more interesting talking about the things that don't work because you can talk about the why and the how and, and what alternate path there were. If you just talk about the things they work, it just gets boring. Um, but we mentioned a few things, though, and I think ultimately, especially like I am going to watch Sinister 2 because that one is still streaming on Netflix right now, So I, and I got my active account. I'm going to look so for I'll it, watch too, it. yeah. Yeah, so I'll watch it um, just out of curiosity to see, like, am I remembering it correctly? I think I am, but um, I I have a feeling it's going, because it, it, it's, I remember feeling a distinct swell of appreciation for the first one when I saw the second one. And I was like, oh, yeah, I really, yeah, I, 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 I don't remember anything. I don't even remember a box, you know, but I'm <laughs> a kid popping out of a box. But I ultimately I feel like it's 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 an achievement, and I, like I said, I'm still looking forward to seeing more things. But um, from from these uh, filmmakers, because um, also it's interesting. Um, Der Scott Derrickson wrote and directed The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which was interestingly enough another film that I felt had a lot of strengths, and then I had a lot of notes, you know. And mm -hmm. I've never really discussed that film. I haven't seen it that one in ages either um i've never seen it. this movie oh okay yeah. uh yeah this is this <laughs> this was like his the big movie he did before that and then he did uh so sinister and um 
I'll have to look it up again. I know that he did Doctor, Doctor Strange. Strange, the first one, yeah. which is interesting because Robert like, Cargill, because yeah. the uh, the new one that's coming out is like supposed to be like a like full on horror film. From yeah. what they've, I mean, I don't believe that because it's MCU, like they're like a like an MCU horror film. Um, yeah, but it, but <laughs> I, he has no involvement in that as far as I know. So. Yeah, no, it's not on his IMDb page, and it would be because that's the next big, uh, as as of this taping, that's the next big MCU movie coming mm-hmm. out, I believe. Um, so, who knows? Maybe, maybe he's too was too busy working on uh, the Black Phone, and you know, may, or maybe they just didn't ask him. I don't know. I, maybe it's a good movie. I like Doctor Strange, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately. Um, I, I, I would return to this movie again. I don't think I'll wait another 10 years to watch it. I might just have to find the right person to, you know, screen it for and just yeah. be like, you know, and, and then just kind of laugh when they get scared. Cause, oh, cause that was one more thing I wanted to talk about in terms of scares. Um, I don't, I don't know if it's going to live on with me because I think I've seen it done before in ways that maybe capture it a little bit more effectively, but I did appreciate um, just kind of like the, the, the low, the uh, low decibel kind of dread that they captured when uh, Ellison is moving through his house and the ghost children are just kind of like dis- appearing and disappearing yeah. into the shadows and just kind of move and again moving in slow motion around him because I think well he's moving so much- in like regular time yeah and yeah. it's it's something that keys into like a very kind of old fear of mine I'm not really afraid of spirits anymore because I, I i guess i'm as afraid of spirits as i am of just like people because i'm like okay some of them are probably going to be assholes but most of them are probably going to be you know all right and not want to get in my face and agitate me but um, <laughs> but just the idea of being watched and of like a presence and stuff like that used to really kind of creep me out as a child not so much anymore but i was just kind of like yeah. I, I wouldn't want to know what's, you know, what's watching me and what's hanging out and just, you know, lurking and everything like that, especially when they're little kid ghosts. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, like, essentially, like, I, I, as far as we know, like, Bagul has, like, eaten their soul. Right. So it's like, like so, that was like, it's just like, they're, they're soulless or something, or they're just part of him at this point. They're an extension of him. What's scary is they can still experience fear because, like, when yeah. he finally appears behind uh, Ashley at the very end of the movie and all the little children have gathered kind of to usher her into the screen uh, or to welcome her, mm-hmm. um, they see him standing behind her and they all run away. And, I'm, and again, it's, that mystery actually is kind of scary to me because I'm like, oh, you'd think they're, they're used to being scary and that they seem to be his minions that, like, maybe... He has stolen some innocence from them, but they're still innocent enough to be afraid of him. That's messed up. I don't like yeah. it. I don't like it. I mean, in a good way. I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> it worked. Okay. So anyway, I, I feel like we've talked as much about this as we can. So let's get on to the cherry picker. All right. So last week we had Texas Chainsaw 2022. And I picked Dante, you picked mm-hmm. Melody, and yeah. uh, Patreon, Instagram, and YouTube, the final uh, poll results were 319 for Dante and 275 for Melody. Wow. So that was, that was your, you weren't <laughs> sure where people were stood on on melody yeah. and I, this is actually really close i mean like uh yeah just in terms of numbers like it because it is kind of like you know almost 50 50 like probably like just looking at the the poll here 53 47 so yeah as i suspected there were some people i read in the comments on youtube at least who were well, just gonna like i mean she turns in the end so, let's uh well, you know. let's go, don't <laughs> reveal that let's let's just go through them right now and see what people did say so okay anthony de puzo i hope de Depuzzo. I hope I said that right. Either one of those. Uh, Dante, one hundred percent. At least Melody changed her tune once. Right. Eventually, um, but it's true. I mean, like she it, she realized that she did a shitty thing. Dante was just kind of like, oh, we, I mean, like his whole thing was like, we got to go back into that house and find the papers to prove that we're right. 
You know, like it was. It, You're never gonna convince me. She annoys me more. She's very annoying. You know what? Honestly, like if if I had first pick, I might have chosen her. So I kind of this, won. This is also just... the difference too. Also, when Dante died, I was like, oh. When she died, I laughed my ass off and cheered. So that <laughs> fair, should be fair enough. But whatever. But if other people don't agree, that's cool. They voted. Um, and I concede. Silent I, I Saturn <laughs> says, uh, to be honest, yeah. I didn't feel strongly about any characters other than Richter. <laughs> Other than Richter, and even then, only because he was smoking hot. I went with Dante <laughs> as we got a bit more of an arc with the melody. Um, so uh, yeah, a little bit of Richter bit love more. there. Um, yeah, that's that's common. I saw Sierra, a lot of that on Instagram. Sierra Cindrell says, I said like 15 minutes into it that I was going to be so mad. I even wasted my time watching this movie if Melody didn't die a painful death. I don't know if I've ever hated a character more than her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. We, I, I got a list. <laughs> I got a list of movies for you. But I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> uh, Love Ghostface says, I don't know if I have a bad feeling toward Dante. I feel like the movie gave us the impression that he did think he owned the old lady's house, even if he hadn't actually checked the papers to make sure. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still sucks, but I don't think it makes him more deserving of death than, let's say, the racist gun guy. Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember Richter being racist at any point. Well, I know what he's talking about, yeah. though. If, if it's a, Is that a him or a they? I know it's what a they're love ghost about. face. Okay, I know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, just because the first, I think I said this in the pod, but like the first time I watched it, I felt a lot more animosity, which I could attribute to racism in yeah. my first screening. And then the second time around, I was like, oh no, I because I'm as annoyed by these ki kids in the car as you all are. Yeah. So I understand. I think because the movie what, was like, threat. Yeah. it was like giving us the perspective of like, we're supposed to hate this guy. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, then surprised us and yeah then on re returning visits yeah we it, know, it almost oh, felt right like there. like we were we were being forced to just like we're like why do we hate this guy he's not that bad but uh, <laughs> no that's understandable uh, man yeah. mandejo says was i the only one who wanted the movie to focus on richter oh. <laughs> apparently no I, I i said that too so we got we got a little richter hate we got a little richter love here it's but a shame they, he got killed. It's funny that, <laughs> that his name back. keeps coming up here. Um, yeah. Jason Slaughter, what an appropriate <laughs> name, says, Melody represented everything wrong with the current generation of Twitter freaks. Thank you! <laughs> yes! Uh, Malik Parker says they both uh -huh. deserve to die, honestly, but Ruth definitely did not. She was hoed. Mm. <laughs> hoed! <laughs> I picked old. Melody, though. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Go neither, on. <laughs> neither do I, but she was hoed. Girl got hoed bad. Uh, H-O-ed? H-O-E-D, hoed. Uh, oh, like a yeah. garden tool. Okay. Uh, yeah, she, I mean, I guess she did because the stab across the belly. Maybe, yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> Tevin Jackson says, I was waiting on Melody to die and then started to grow sour when it looked like she was the final girl. Uh. Uh, Thomas Baker says, Dante, definitely Dante. And Lucid21 asks, why Dante? What did he do? I didn't see the film. Well. Oh. <laughs> 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 Why are you in the comments section? I think I wrote back. I said, see the film. Um, but yeah. I, I mean, comment wise, it looked like a lot of people uh, agreed with you, but the numbers speak for themselves. So there you go. I, I get first dibs here. And I mean, like I, it should come as no surprise to you. Right. I'm going with Ellison Oswalt because I mean, for all the reasons we said and more, just like a really shitty parent um just selfish narcissistic and uh I ignores actual evidence that could result in in the apprehension of a multi-generational serial killer and even if it is supernatural why are you putting your family into a situation 
that could result in all of your deaths and the disappearance of one of your children. So mm-hmm. short and sweet, it's it's going to be him. Yeah, really just listen to the whole pod over yeah. again and you got the <laughs> argument. <laughs> but All right, um, my choice, because uh, this is really the only other person who I would, wouldn't would mind seeing die and who, you know what, actually does deserve to die more so just because of like the damage uh, they've caused. And I'm choosing Bagul, Mr. Boogie himself. Uh, is that because... allowed? Why isn't it? He's a character. Uh carry on we'll we'll see how this goes (laughs) no i'm choosing i'm choosing him because ultimately he's the source of all of the suffering that is depicted in the movie um and granted he's got a lot of idiots helping him along the way but he's i mean when you can't be called the eater of children and not deserve to die that's (laughs) and also the fact that okay I know it's the children drawing the little drawings of him and everything like and calling him Mr. Boogie and everything like that. You know what I don't like about that? It, it It's spelled B-O-O-G-I-E, like Boogie Nights. Like, hey, come on, baby, let's boogie. I don't like that. I don't find mm-hmm. that uh, We needed, uh, like, the last scene in... of the movie needed to be uh, Bagul, like, just <laughs> taking out his 10-inch prosthetic in front of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Very Dirk Diggler, yes. <laughs> um, or even just singing a musical number, just going like, you're joking, you're joking. I can't <laughs> believe my ears are Mr. Oogie Boogie and all that. But um, <laughs> but see, that's the thing. is like the fact that he's called... Also, another thing it made me think about the first time I saw it spelled out on the page, I thought like... Because in the UK, don't they refer to boogers as boogies? <laughs> So I thought he's like Mr. Boogie, like, <laughs> like Mr. Snot, or something like that, which is, again, not intimidating in the least. So, I mean, the, I think he could be legendary if he got a good PR person or at least got the kids to stop calling him Mr. Boogie. Mm-hmm. But um, I think uh, he, he, he hasn't earned, as you mentioned pretty much from the offset with this pod, he hasn't really kind of like earned his place on the mantle alongside the Freddy, the Jason, the Michael. These are all just regular names too. Yeah. He's got Bagul. He could have been Bagul. But no, nobody, <laughs> I, I didn't even remember either of the names to tell you the truth. But Bagul <laughs> actually could have resonated more if that's the only one they used. But um, yeah, and the fact that I look at him and think that he's kind of derivative of Billy from Saw. I mean, that's... I, I He's a Billy I, Slenderman... I, 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 mix yeah there you go because he's got he has no face like there's no like there's no like mouth really um and it's like he's wearing like the 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 black suit so you know it's just and black eyes just black 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 eyes yeah Yeah. um so i mean yeah i uh, but but, uh, yeah uh, the eater of children caused all the suffering all the suffering on screen and um yeah i've made my point i've made my case vote your conscience vote your heart i will allow that I feel like that is a little bit of a cheat because Bagul is not like a living entity. Like you can't kill that which is not dead. But okay, he's obviously not dead. He's... <laughs> he could have been. See, th- this is why we needed more of the but, lore. We needed to know: is there a way yeah. to destroy Bagul, him? Is there a way he's to a, he's, him? he's an idea. He's not a he's not a person. Okay, ideas don't consume we children. We will. They do. <laughs> ideas definitely consume children. What are you talking about? And make them evaporate from reality? No. Absolutely. I... <laughs> Absolutely. I've seen it happen before. Anyway, those are your two. Those are your two picks. You can you can pick Ellis or you can pick Bagul. Uh, we'll see where this one goes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you can vote uh, on uh, the YouTube community section. You can vote on Instagram. Uh, We'll put the handles up uh, momentarily. And uh, you can also vote on Patreon. Uh, And I would also like to welcome our newest Patreon supporter, Olax. Uh, So thank you for coming aboard. if you if you want to support uh, the podcast or you know my main YouTube channel, Patreon is the way to do it. You will get to see and hear these uh, podcasts the uh, Friday before Friday or Saturday um, before they're released. So that's uh, one benefit of doing that, and uh, you're going a long way in helping us, you know, produce this and making it better. So yeah. thank you for that. I also do want to thank Andre Felix for Yay! helping with editing all these 
and uh, da, 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 da. also if you are new to this and you're listening to the podcast uh, mm-hmm. you can see our faces uh, in the video format of that if you go to the cherry picker on YouTube uh, and if you are watching this on YouTube you can also listen to it in audio format uh, we are available in both so the RSS feed is going to be in the descriptions below and uh, we do have a review on Apple Podcasts. Oh, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. So let me find that here. And this one comes from Kyle Miller, 26. Uh, I absolutely love this. The podcast is amazing so far. I was so excited you were starting a podcast after being such a good fan of your YouTube channels. Great episodes so far, and I cannot wait to listen to future episodes. Five stars all the way. Awesome. I know. That's so nice. I, I, I mean, these are the thing with like the Apple podcasts, because like I have to like go individually and look like through every country. So it's like I happen to find this one because he's uh, in Canada. So it like automatically comes up. But if, if anyone is sure. ri- writing any reviews, which please do like it, it helps the podcast yeah. get noticed if you're even if you're watching this on youtube like make sure you you like and uh subscribe and, and do all that like comment as well because yeah. it does help uh the podcast and the channel and all that get noticed um and and again you know makes things better so you know we appreciate that like kyle thank you for yeah. for sharing your thoughts and if anyone else wants to uh, let us know how we're doing. You can review us on Apple Podcasts. Maybe just drop me a line in like the the video and just and you can say what region you're from and I'll be able to find it easier and we can read it on the on the podcast. But uh, also, uh, if you are new and you didn't know, as uh, Kyle pointed out, I do have another YouTube channel. It's just under Zach Cherry. So that's kind of my main channel. You can check that out as well. Um, you can also follow... Uh, either Eddie and I on social media. What's your handle? My handle is Edward is Truth. You can at me there. All one word. <laughs> Edward is Truth. <laughs> and you can find me under Retro Bitch Face. And that's where the uh, the Cherry Picker poll will be on Instagram. And uh, also I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm not as active on it, but you can find me at uh, Zach Cherry 8 I always forget. I was I'm pretty sure it's it's in the descriptions uh, of of the the podcast. Um, right. Anyway, uh, next week, what do we got going on? Uh, I, my brain just went. Oh out. no! What do we have going on? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Okay. Uh, represented by the color green, likes gold. Oh, leprechaun! I need me gold. Yes, that's what we're, we're doing. We're doing leprechaun. Just in time for St. Patty's Day. So yeah. we got that coming up anyway. That is all we have for you in this episode. Thank you so much for watching, listening, and we will be right back. <laughs> <laughs>